The way I look at when you have volatility this extraordinarily low, interest rates this high, the market this expensive, and all my indicators from a commodity standpoint tilting towards recessionary um, deflation, typically just takes a spark. Now, what's that spark? A week ago, we had elections kicking in, which are some of an issue in, in Europe. Whatever the market interprets, I don't I don't really care so much. The spark is tilted towards underweighting risk assets and overweighting risk off assets like treasury bonds and gold. We're joined once again by Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll be going over his overall outlook on the economy as well as his updates on commodities and Bitcoin. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Thank you, David. It's good to be back. Good to see you as always. We had you on a couple months ago. Uh, data has changed since a few months. Most notably, we're seeing more disinflation in the CPI. The last uh, prints were both headline and core came in a little bit lower than consensus expectations. How are you reading the data? Um, still sticky. Um, I see it as um, part of what's going to be that tilt um, towards recession. But and it's got a really good reason to be sticky. The U.S. stock market's on a tear. Total market capitalization, the U.S. stock market's about two times GDP on the way up. That's similar to 1929. Market cap, for example, in 2000 at the peak was about 1.5 times GDP. It's keeping inflation very sticky. Um, for instance, CPI right now, 3.3% 3 .3 is exactly the same as it was in 2000. And it didn't drop until after the stock market went down. So to me, that's part of the problem. Everything is somewhat related. It's kind of silly not to expect a stock market at two times GDP not to matter. Um, but that's where we are. Um, I think we're at the cusp of heading towards severe, let's just say, deflation worthy of this significant inflation. We got to that big money pump in in uh, 2000 to the peak in 2022. Yeah, I've been early. I can say I've been wrong. But now the tilt is starting to go that way. One good indicator is look at global bond yields. 2.26% is the 10-year note, note CGB yield. That's a Chinese government bond. A year ago, it was about 50 basis points higher. That's 200 basis points less than the U.S. You look at the top five countries of the world, their average 10-year note yield is about 100 basis points below the U.S. 10-year note at 4.3 or so. Before COVID, they were 100, 150 basis points higher. So to me, that's the tilt from a global scale. It's all starting to go that way. You see copper put in a pretty good peak, crude oil put in a pretty good peak. Now gold has put in all two new highs, backed up a little, but I think it's a matter of time it goes up and everything is predicated on, I think, for this to really kick in the way I think it might. Um, the U.S. stock market at some point has to kind of give up the ghost, but it's so expensive. It's just a question of how long you can stay here and it can stay expensive for a while. Well, I appreciate you revisiting your calls for us, uh, Mike. We can uh, actually take a look at Mike's uh, calls in my previous episodes with him. Links down below. But Mike, you were right about calling for uh, I guess, less inflation, uh, more disinflation, um, and then eventually outright deflation. We, we've seen that in some sectors of the economy. So I brought this up several times over the last couple of weeks on my show. The fact that big box stores, Amazon, Target, um, Walmart are cutting prices. I don't know if they're cutting. They haven't announced they're cutting prices across the board. It's not a store-wide sell-off of prices, but they are cutting prices on grocery items. I wonder if this is just store-specific or it's a broader trend of retailers losing purchasing power or pricing power, rather. Just getting started. Let's look at the big picture macro. Virtually, we just finished a G7 summit, and I think 25 times they pointed to China in not a happy way. And virtually every major country will now is trying to push back on the severe deflationary forces out of China, BYD, Huawei, uh, renewable, anything and everything, which every product, they're just flooding the world with deflating products. Um, and that's fully what you expect from a rapidly advancing emerging market that's simply reverting. It's just matter of time and it's just starting to kick in so now let's look for my space more specifically um virtually every country in the world has to support their currencies versus the dollar you look at the yen at 158 at the moment <laughs> if you look at that spread in yields u.s penny note or p bills at five percent and what do you get in china in, in japan and even china the whole world's tilting towards china so to me that's part of the 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 macro big picture then i look at things more specifically in my space in the u.s we have declining demand recessionary trajectories for diesel diesel's the grease 
of the U.S. economic system. Unleaded gasoline. Yes, we had a little bounce for um, the Memorial Day weekend, but overall the trends are much lower for for demand pull. And then corrugated boxes, container boards. I mean, this is stuff I used to watch really closely when I was trading treasuries 30 years ago. All those trajectories are very similar akin to 2008, 2009, heading lower. And then we'd still have things like the inverted curve, leading indicators still negative. And the bottom line is it doesn't matter. U.S. stock market goes up. But at some point, all those things will matter. And it might have to take uh, the stock market to go down for people to start realizing that this is a pretty normal, uh, worthy reaction to um, that biggest money pump in history that's all starting to tilt downward now. Before continuing with the interview, I want to take a moment to tell you about today's sponsor, Caleb and Brown. Now, the crypto market has rallied dramatically this year, but in a volatile year, even in a bull year, many traders and investors have experienced an altcoin growing 10x, only to find it very difficult to try to off-ramp the tokens into USD or other fiats. So this is where brokerage firm Caleb and Brown comes in. Caleb and Brown compare hundreds of coins directly with all major fiat currencies. This and the fact that there are no trade maximums or withdrawal limits means clients can seamlessly place limit orders and stop limit trades. Caleb and Brown has been operating since 2016, going through numerous bull and bear markets, having a history of consistent uptime, even in the most volatile periods. So skip the wait line, sign up. Right now, using my link down below or the QR code here. Let's touch on the uh, asset classes that you cover now. Let's start with stocks, yeah. the broader picture. So you mentioned stock market several times. We have a, a new outlook from Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs boosts S&P 500 target on an upbeat profit outlook. They're now projecting uh, end of year to be 5,600. Um, this is up from before 5,200. And the new target implies roughly 3% advance in the gauge from its Friday close. Uh, what are we at right now? We're at, uh, well, not too far from that, but yeah. 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 So um, they're expecting, well, yeah, what, what, what's your take? When's the last time we heard a major house like that Goldman Sachs or so put out a bearish comment in equities? It's, it's the nature. It's the way they're supposed to do it. They have to ride the FOMO, have to create it, have to... Um, push it forward. But I recently just did a bit showing the Euro stocks index. Last week, it dropped 4%. Um, you're overweight that Euro stocks index, Euro stocks 50 versus 100 week moving average. It virtually never sustains more than 20% above its 100 week moving average. It just Tick there and it's rolled back down. And I overlay that with gold versus copper. And it's just a matter of time we get some normal reversion. You look at the U.S. stock market versus GDP, it's two times. That's the most expensive since on the way up in 1929. And I also look at the key indicator, David, that really helped me do well in 2008. I just was early in 2007 is U.S. stock market volatility, the VIX volatility index. Um, versus a T-bell rate, the 52-week move, moving average of that level that gave me a good indication for the, the Great Recession is the lowest since 2007. Volatility is extraordinarily low. Interest rates are very high, and I think it's somewhat irresponsible now for sell-side strategies not to be overweighting um, treasuries and T-bills um, when volatility is this low, and you've seen these inklings on a global scale towards deflation. But that's how it always works. You never pick the top. Um, and usually it happens um, when people least expect it. I'm not picking a top. I'm just pointing at some point the reversion is like I'm seeing these plunging U.S. Treasury yield, just yield, bond yield, just catching up to the rest of the world. That will all matter. If the problem is, I think um, a lot of these expectations from strategists is for the Federal Reserve to ease, and I think they're missing the point of what's happened. The Fed, for the Fed to ease an environment of significant speculative frenzy in equities with this interest rates and so with inflation well above their targets is just silly. So the market's priced in too much of that hopium, and I think it's going to get the realism that you get when everybody anticipates the same thing. It usually doesn't happen. So that's why I'm still quite, quite bullish gold, um, still quite bullish um, treasury long bonds, been early, been wrong on those, um, and bearish all, virtually all risk assets. And the problem with that and that space is one of the riskiest assets is Bitcoin, and that's starting to show pretty divergent weakness for a couple months now. We're going to get to Bitcoin in just a minute, but you mentioned right. yields. Do you think yields are leading stocks right now? The weakness in the 10-year, is that going to precipitate into the equity markets? 
I think we're at that silly stage and the equity market's just going to go up until it stops going up and then it's going to go down and underperform for a significant period of time, which is very rational. After the biggest period, um, longest period in history of zero interest rates that got the stock market to two times GDP in terms of market capitalization. At some point, that's going to revert down. It always does. It always has. I think we're just at that silly stage. We haven't got that yet. And it's elevating everything. But also we have what's really happening globally. It was a paradigm shift in what happened in the world when President Xi declared an unlimited friendship with President Putin. Now, the whole world of Western rules realized, okay, the U.S. is a safe haven. Um, we have U.S. treasuries are still high. U.S. stock market is still high, but gold is right in, in between there. So I look at it just a matter of time that we all follow what China is doing, turning Japanese, and then the U.S., finally has a little bit of a bear market in the stock market, which we haven't had a real bear market. I mean, which stays down for five years since the bottom in 2009. So um, everything is it's just hard to not overweight the significance of equities at two times GDP on inflation and sentiment and even on the Fed. So there's why I pick, I, I tilt over to all my commodities. I see um, copper probably putting a pretty good peak recently. It's following the issues in China. Um, natural gas looks like a pretty good, pretty good high. It bounced from the lows and went higher. Crude oil put in a pretty good peak a little while ago. All the grains are heading lower and you have to figure out what's going to stop it. And then we also have this strength in the dollar situation, which I'm Fortunately, I'll end with this. The lessons I've learned from my our equity strategist, Gina Martin Adams, is there's been a almost tick for tick correlation between the US stock market outperforming the world and the US dollar strength. So what's it gonna take for that to revert? It's kind of a lose-lose for most risk assets. Touch on quite a few commodities that I want to touch on before yeah. we close off today. So the uh, 10 year yield, what do you think the weakness in the 10 year yield was tracking? Uh in broad stroke terms. So it was at 4.7% not too long ago, two months ago. Now it's at 4.27. Uh, is this projecting lower inflation? Is it projecting lower economic growth? Is it projecting a weakness in the dollar? Is it projecting the Fed cut by the end of the year? All the above, none of the above? Some of, I would say that's more all the above, David. And it's just one of the things from being a born and raised bond guy. I started in the treasury bond pits and in Chicago yeah. Board of Trade in, in the 80s is bond markets are your best guidance. And so mm -hmm. Chinese CGB yield at 2.26%. Um, um, JG, you know, and, and the average of the top five countries, including India, at 100 basis points below that U.S. 10, you know, means that's where the world's tilting and it's all being held up by the Fed funds rate of 5.33 percent. At some point, that's got to go down, but it can't go down until inflation goes down and that might take the stock market to go down. So you see that whole tilt. Um, and But bond yields, I think, are telling me they're still the curves inverted. And once you people... You know, it was kind of early. We're two years into this inverted curve. Once people give up on that matter, and that's when it's going to matter. And I think it'll be one of those um, suddenly after gradually. Um, I just don't know what's going to speak this. Basically, the way I look at when you have volatility this extraordinarily low, interest rates this high, the market this expensive, and all my indicators from a commodity standpoint tilting towards recessionary um, deflation typically just takes a spark. Now, what's that spark? A week ago, we had elections kicking in, which are some of an issue in, in Europe. I, whatever the market interprets, I don't, I don't really care so much. Is the spark is tilted towards um, underweighting risk assets and overweighting risk off assets like treasury bonds and gold? Do you think recent news of Saudi Arabia, um, not I guess. I want to call it renewing, but uh, continuing the petrodollar agreement, uh, the handshake that they had 50 years ago, that have anything to do with the treasuries. Now, keep in mind, part of yeah. the agreement was selling their excess oil capacity and buying treasuries, which uh, you know they may or may not be doing right now. They want to diversify. Does this have any impact on the treasuries market at all? No, I think it's more inevitable. It's just one of those indications why I'm quite still remain quite bearish crude oil. It's got to get to that low price cure. Is that let's look at the SPR. The SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, was was started in the 70s to cover 90 days, about 90 days of net imports. Now with US and Canada, liquid fuels and crude oil, the US and Canada ex exports about six million barrels a day. That's enough to cover the SPR in a couple months. <laughs> I mean, back then. And what's what's been sold out of it. So the world's changed and the world's changed rapidly. Most no, because the U.S. and Canada have adopted this rapidly advancing technology, have reduced the demand for all petroleum products and increased supply. Where's that trend going? Saudi Arabia, I should say, OPEC is making themselves redundant. So sorry, guys, but the world's moved on from your 
not completely, but it is going the way of whale oils. I mean, it's just being re replaced by technology. That's the fact of crude oil. And that's one thing that was really accelerated by the unlimited friendship and then Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It pumped up prices, gave us the whole world incentive to find alternatives, produce more supply, and move on from dicey sources. It clearly has happened in the grains. They're all heading now. The whole trajectory for that space is lower. So I think that's just a good indication of how the world's moved on. And now the question is, what are the next steps? And so my basis for crude oils, it has to get cheap, like natural gas. It means $40 a barrel. That's not profound. Um, that's what it does the last few times. But as far as the dollar and treasuries, it just shows the strength of the U.S. I mean, being the net largest importer of energy, switching to the net largest, ex one of the largest producers and exporters, not a bad thing for the dollar. And then you look at things like cryptos, the whole space is gone for the dollar through that space. And the most widely traded is Tether. So that means a dollar. And then look at U.S. Treasuries at 5.33% net U.S. T-bill guaranteed the safest asset on the planet. Go ahead, find a better asset. And, and for any other country, you name a better one, it's like, good luck. You're not going to get that in Saudi Arabia or China, even in, in Europe. Um, so that's the unstoppable force of the dollar, which is bad for commodities yeah. um, overall. M makes sense. A lot of people were talking about the dumping of the dollar, but what you said makes I sense. It. Diversify that. It. Yeah, good luck. Where are they going to go? Yeah, but on, go. On oil it's the only other place. It's only a, it's only a fiat currency that's even close. All your fiat currencies are becoming less significant and less valuable versus the dollar until we get U.S. rates oh. to plunge. Gold isn't as liquid as on the uh, you know global exchanges, the treasuries market is. So. There's, there's that. Uh, I want to get your take on the IEA's report here. I think this broadly supports your oil thesis, but I'll just read a paragraph here. Um, this came out last week. Oil demand will gradually slow, hitting its peak by 2029 and plateauing after that. The IEA anticipates the oil supply hitting 114 million barrels a day by the end of the decade, roughly 8 million barrels a day higher than demand. This is a quote from the report. This would result in levels of spare capacity never before other than at the height of the COVID 19 lockdowns in 2022 or 2020 never before seen since the pandemic they said yeah so it's and it's i and enjoyed reading write, writing about this a few years ago when on the way up i was wrong initially i just pointed out this is gonna when crude oil went to 30 and on the way up there i said this is the spark to go back to 50 or below not only because that's always what it's done um because now it's happening at a time with the most significant advance in technology ever as we we have a major issue with trying to push back on all these cheap evs from china which are 10 times or almost two actually five times more efficient and better than the plug-in hybrid i bought 10 years ago and I still drive. It's just the way things are going. It's just unstoppable for things like that. So I think um, the key risk right now, first in the short term, I'll point out crude oil is significantly oversold. Managed money net positions are just completely sold out. They got way too long at that high around 87, sold out completely down to 72. I'm talking WTI and right now around $80 a barrel. They're still too sold out. The prices in the short term don't go down, but the market's bumping up against support. And at some point it's going to go down. And I think the key risk is the US stock market, just a little backup in bait and all those assets go down, particularly crude and copper. But from a macro standpoint, what the IEA is pointing out is just the simple lessons of Adam Smith. The high price cure is kicking in. Just things that we predicted a few years ago. And it's just more significant now than ever in the world's most autocorrelated um, major commodity, which is crude oil. And if you want the shorter term version in the most elastic commodities, it's the grains. And they're all heading lower, too. I just wonder if they are underestimating demand growth. I mean, part of the IEA's forecast, I guess, assumes that the electrification of the energy market, uh, the electrification of cars, for example, is going to cut demand. But, you know, we're starting to see a lot of reversals of green policies around the world, we're starting to see a lot of reversals of companies not committing to the 2030 all electric fleet targets. What's your take? Oh, there's going to be bumps in the road. But the um, I have a Chevy Volt. I paid thirty six thousand dollars for it in two thousand fourteen with subsidies. I got it lower, wow. and it gets three hundred miles, forty on electric. It's a great vehicle. I love it. Wow! Right now, the plug in hybrid from DD, D, BYD you can get for thirteen grand. It's it's its range is thirteen thousand miles. Yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> just where things are going, and we have to push back on it because those deflationary forces out of China are accelerating because they have to because nothing they have nothing else well, there's, there's, there's a hundred percent tariff on chinese Has evs right now right yeah so, so we like, all we, we yeah it just it, see what that why do we have that because 
the deflation forces are that significant. So what's going? Where's that going? Just showing where it's all going. So there's going to be bumps in the road. But even without this whole EV revolution, it's since crude oil did that big run up to the to the um, the 1973-74 when uh, we had the um, um, Yom Kippur War. Every single time it spikes, it goes down hard. And particularly when you have, which is just the last two examples of Iran-Iraq war, spiked up to 30, dropped down to 10 a couple of years later. And then um, Kuwait's invasion of, of um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, popped up to 40 initially, down to 20, and didn't bottom until 10. We're in the same trajectory now. Yeah. And I was talking to somebody, uh, th- they made the point that inflation-adjusted oil really isn't as high as you make it out to be right now. It's, well, no, it's so it, quite no, affordable it, for, it, right. It, $79 a barrel was first trade in 2007. So <laughs> imagine what right. the stock market's done since then. Yeah. Natural gas, the number one measure of heat, electricity, and fertilizer in this country. It's low this year. It was about $1.50. Right now it's about two eighty, but it was, it, that was first, to, the levels that traded this year was first traded in 1990. Severe deflationary forces for the number one source of heat, electricity, and fertilizer in this country. Now, there's one market I say this leads to reach the lower price cure. It's bounced, but now it's probably peaked. The, the, the Jan contract got around four. Same thing if you tilt over to things like the most elastic, the grains. The, the cost of production for a, a, a bushel of of corn in this country is below four dollars a barrel. It's just going to go there. The peak was around eight in 2022, 22, and a lot of it's just rapidly advancing technology pushing prices lower. So from a commodity standpoint, I see nothing but severe deflation. But that's the rules of Adam Smith and Jeff Booth. The price of tomorrow's technology will always push commodities towards their cost of production. It's the inflation we're seeing in a lot of services goods, less so, and most of that's right now still is almost. Comp- completely being supported by the stock market that's most elevated on the way up versus GDP since 1929. So that to me is is the just the reversion that's going to happen. And if you look at from a historical standpoint, reversion following that big pump on the back of the, the biggest money pump in history is a normal situation. We just haven't got there. We've got a lot farther than people like I thought would it would. But I think this tilt towards what you mentioned with um, declining prices, with BYD, with what's happening in China, with declining bond yields in China, and U.S. Treasuries continue to widening that inversion uh, is um, just all going that way. You said, you said deflation of commodities. What about base metals? What about copper? Let's so, just take copper, for example. Yeah. Copper looks like it put in a pretty good peak around $5.20 a pound recently. It was really much driven by speculative frenzy in futures. It got the most net long in about three or four years, put in that peak. And the problem is right now, they're still way long. So copper, when it gets to 30, when, when total positions that are specs get to 30% of total open interest, it's a sign of, of specs drive. And they put in a good high. I think copper right at $4.43 is probably going to go back down to four, maybe even lower. And that's not profound. That's what it almost always does. You basically need demand pull sources from China. You need the sustained supply issues out of most notably Panama at the moment. Otherwise, copper is going to do what it normally does. And if you look at bond yields in China, that to me is where copper is going. Like I said, you it's got bond yields at three, two point two six is not bullish for that that number one demand source for industrial metals. Now, in the big picture, everybody's bought in, gets into the electrification, decarbonization trend. But I think what happened is specs got way too long. So as we speak right now, they're still way too long copper, which means pressure down. The opposite in crude. So it's kind of giving me a little bid for crude in the short term. But that's what's happened. In the in, in terms of commodities, they switch from a macro market of com- uh, commodity market to more of a market of commodities and we're seeing some of those nuances in between but in the big picture i think the whole space still has major risk to head lower with the exception of gold well the other argument is that the advent of ai and the use of data centers is going to propel the use of these base metals blackwell gpus from nvidia were just announced a huge upgrade in processing power huge huge upgrade in the intake of energy analysts are projecting that look we're not sufficient in our grid capacity to service millions of these gpus that uh ceo jensen huang said need to needs to come online so, so yeah I, I i'm glad you mentioned that it's a complete known known i've heard it for years and it's what people say when they buy it at the highs and then when they get stopped out 
other people buy it and say, okay, thank you very much. It's just the way the markets work. I, I completely agree with that. We got, copper did make a new high, crude oil didn't. In the long term, copper is going to, here's the way I look at it. Copper is going to continue to outperform crude oil, particularly. Um, but gold is going to continue to outperform copper. These are long dated trends. But what you said is, yep. It's definitely true in the macro big picture, but a lot of those people bought it up into five are getting stopped down below, stopped out below four now. And the specs are driving that market at the moment. At some point, I think once we flush out those specs, maybe get down to four. It'll be, but for now, it's just a trading environment. And the macro big picture for copper is big issue is never be be careful where bond yields are tilting, and that stock market has to stay elevated. So when we have that normal say 10% correction in the U.S. stock market, which we haven't had since that bottom in, um, in I would think it was, yeah, it was December, or no, October. Since we have had that bottom October, then we're going to see that we have to see what happens. But overall, the, the issue, issue with copper is macro big picture, sure. Long, short term right now, heading lower. I want to uh, finish off on gold and uh, Bitcoin for the last couple of minutes. So Bitcoin, uh, you mentioned earlier, trailing, trailing lower, uh, p- potentially leading the weakness and other risk assets. What is happening right now? It had a good run up until, I think, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Well, it's had a good run, but it had a good reason to make a new high and has a tremendous reason to be in a severe hangover for a long time. So the combination of beta making new highs, uh, record highs, the uh, launch of the ETFs, people waiting for a decade, particularly us at Bloomberg, who try to launch indices to track. And um, the halving was a perfect storm for new highs, but it's done that. And people are re- remembering uh, now that this vol- highly volatile speculative digital asset is that. And it's way underperforming beta for a couple months now. And I'm afraid that's going to continue. Now, the way I look at Bitcoin is, and the way I look at gold is you can't really hold gold anymore without some Bitcoin in space. In the long term, very bullish Bitcoin, declining, definable diminishing supply, increasing demand and adoption. But for now, it's a highly speculative risk asset that trades three times the value to the S&P 500 and gold. And I fully expect the biggest risk to all markets is beta having a little back and fill, which means Bitcoin will probably lead the way down because it's a leading an- indicator and gold will be one of the best performers along with long bonds. So that's where we are tilting right now. I'd like to see the proof of what people tell me that, oh, Bitcoin's going to outperform this and it's going to be more of a risk off asset. I'm like, show me the proof. Every day I look at it, my pattern recognition um, radar says this asset is poorly performing um, versus beta and beta is made and just sticking at new highs and Bitcoin kind of inches up rather than it used to lead the way up so to me that's part of where we are now and at some point when beta corrects and beta gets i think when beta drops enough and bitcoin will become the right asset but for now it's very expensive well just to illustrate your point uh on it underperforming so i'll show a chart on the screen here on the in the last 30 days one month uh the nasdaq index which has historically been Tightly correlated with Bitcoin is up six and a half percent. Bitcoin is down zero point one five percent. So um, decoupling in the last, I would say, one week with the Nasdaq trailing up and the Bitcoin price just falling. Um, this is uh, is this normal? Like- well, so all the Bitcoiners would tell me, oh, you're picking a point in time. And here's the thing I like to do is, as a strategist, I try to be ahead of the game. It's, we've had significant inflows in ETFs. And despite that, the Bitcoin ran up into that launch. Now, despite all these inflows and record high, high setting beta, it's trickling down. The way I love to look at Bitcoin is versus gold. You take Bitcoin versus gold, that ratio over time, I've been watching it for a decade. And right now, it's it's um, basically 28 ounces of gold for uh, per uh, one Bitcoin. I mean, the high was 37 back in 21. The high in this move was 33. You see the trend there? It's making lower highs. That that overall trend is starting to show divergent weakness despite beta making record highs. And my point is beta is the most expensive I've seen it in my lifetime. Volatility is the lowest since 2007. When we get that back up, you have to expect Bitcoin to suffer. And it's showing that. But maybe this leading indicator is leading. And one thing I do um, enjoy significant pushback from from Bitcoin people, which typically means um, when everybody agrees with you, you're generally wrong. Okay. (laughs) On that note, uh, do you think Bitcoin is going to reach 100K by the end of the year, which I think a lot of big banks like Standard Charter are projecting? I think it's like 150,000 now they're upgrading the forecast. Prerequisite for that to me is beta has to keep rising a lot mm-hmm. if history is a guide. And we have to have a pretty significant continued pump of liquidity. And that's the thing people are forgetting about Bitcoin. It was born and raised of the financial crisis. And it's been part of this 
pump in financial risk assets and the and a um, beneficiary of the longest period in history of zero interest rates. Now we've got risk assets so expensive. I've never seen them this expensive in my life. And the zero interest rates are gone. So I look at it as that's kind of good luck with that one. And the kind of thing I'm fe- fearful about is those things come out in bull markets when you have to be circumspect and be careful. It's when, in bear markets when people say it's going to zero is when you typically want to buy it. And when you hear that in bull markets, when you typically have to say, okay, there's some with a vested interest. And big picture, I pick, I predicted a long time ago, um, just by based on the long-term trends. The problem right, it was shifted right now is you got to have a prerequisite for beta keep going up. And even lately, the fastest horse in the race is underperforming beta. So I'm concerned that it's the leading indicator is lagging for a reason, meaning that everything is going to have just a little bit of normal reversion typically happens after you have the biggest pump in history of liquidity. One, one final note on Bitcoin. I'll move on to gold and finish off there. Uh, this year, as we've seen Bitcoin move up to new all-time highs, it just it, it's fascinating for me working in the media industry that it hasn't been covered a lot or as much as a 2021 bull cycle. If you actually if you look at Google Trends, for example, the word Bitcoin has shown less interest in this bull cycle than the last one. I wonder why the hype this time has been relatively muted, despite the fact that it is a new all-time high. I wonder why the retail crowd perhaps wasn't as interested this time as the last time. Have you noticed that? Well, NVIDIA on a five-year basis is up 3,000% and Bitcoin's up but 700, right? I mean, seriously, I look at that as, so if you're a money manager, typical, traditional, and you lose money in NVIDIA in the next year or two, man, big deal. I mean, you're just riding a trend. But if you lose money in Bitcoin, you might have a problem. Now, the inflows are great. But maybe you pointed out why it's lagging. I mean, yeah, it's still up 55% of the year and get that. But I, I point out it's it's in a significant hangover right now for a good reason. And it's a question what's going to blunt. And I, I just look at what's been it's what's been driving this asset for 15 years is likely uh, going away. Uh, gold. How do you feel about gold? It's slightly down on the day today on Monday. Overall, though, how does it fit into your deflationary or disinflation picture? It's a matter of time. It goes to 3,000. In my view, it could get down to 2,200 or maybe lower. But what's really happening in gold to me was a paradigm shift I mentioned is the shift in the world order from um, the Russia and China having an unlimited friendship. I mean, it shifted the world order completely with gold in the middle and benefiting gold. But what's really been happening in gold is we've had since the end of 2022, about 13 million ounces of outflows in gold ETFs. I mean, it's the most unappreciated, um, out of favor asset in terms of ETFs, yet we've had about 50 million ounces of inflows from central, I would say inflows buying from central banks. So I think what's happening is we've started the latest to slow down the rallies. China mentioning they're cutting back. Well, China's been always been a good trader. They buy low, sell high. Um, I don't think they're going to stop accumulating. But what I think is going to happen soon, Dave, is we're going to see those ETF outflows start flipping to inflows. And for that to happen, this mantra that why buy gold with the U.S. stock market on a tear and, and T-bills at 5% will some point shift. But it hasn't yet. Now, we're seeing bottoming in gold ETF flows, but not they'd take off higher, which I think will be the next key leg. And part of that, I think, will coincide with um, things like PLT and treasury bonds starting to outperform. Again, so one of the worst performing assets for three years now has been U.S. treasury bonds. At some point, they're going to pop higher, I think, and be an enduring bull market. Usually, it's a foundation for enduring bull market. And one of the most out of favor assets in turning ETS flows has been gold. At some point, I think that's going to flip. So I'm still very bullish gold versus most risk assets, particularly versus most commodities. And I'm curious what it might take to trip that up. See, what I'm concerned about with gold is that a lot of the buying this year came from Asia. The Chinese, for example, up, according to the World Gold Council, 68% on their demand yeah. this year. And so if – let's assume they're done buying, okay? The huge inflows last year. Uh, what's next for them? Because they're done. North Americans need to step up to the plate. There, there's been outflows from North America, as you know. That needs to come back into inflows. And like you pointed out before, yields have been up. Gold has been up. Gold has been counter trend to a lot of the variables that usually push it down. It's only a matter of time before it corrects if you look at it that way, right? Yeah, it started a correction. I think it's a bull market correction. It made record highs. It's it's so the, the technicals and the fundamentals are so ideal for gold to make new highs. And one way I really like to compare it is versus the S&P 500. It basically takes... 2.4 ounces or so per one S&P 500. Historically, that shows gold's very cheap in S&P 500. And every time we've had a recession and the stock market is that high and gold's that low, they just kind of revert. So that's the bottom line, I think. And everything else is kind of just noise for gold. And I, 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 
I don't. Um, I think we have to be careful focusing on the, what I learned at Trading Beats. Don't pits. Don't be a weenie for the teeny. The macro for gold is overwhelming, and that is what's unless we have some kind of significant shift towards detente. But there is Cold War 2.0 going on. It's getting hotter every day, and um, gold is right in the middle. And it's and it's and not only that, the technicals are so re- ready for a breakout, and ETFs are so out of favor, and U.S. stocks are so in favor. Just a little bit of reversion in that means um, when the stock market has a normal correction, and when we have this tilt towards more deflation in the U.S., gold's the shining star. Perfect. I always appreciate your updates. Very timely, very thorough. Thank you, Mike. Where can we follow you? Learn more about you. Well, uh, thank you for that, Dave, David. I really appreciate being on your program. I'm um, you. on the Bloomberg Terminal first, linked in uh, at Mike. I'm um, so Mike McGlone, uh, senior commodity strategist, and an uh, X um, at Mike McGlone eleven. Okay, we'll put the links down below. Thank you again, Mike. We'll speak again soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.